Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you this afternoon. My name is Katherine Frank. I'm the Executive Director for the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at UNC Asheville, and I want to welcome you to our third webinar, which is focused on uh, in a series focused on racial disparity in our community. First, just a little bit of housekeeping. Today's session is in a webinar format, so a as a participant, you won't be able to see yourself online or to speak to the group. You will be able to see our panelists and any materials they share. If you have a question for our speakers, please click on the icon on your screen that says Q&A, type your question, and hit um, return to send it. Once the webinar begins, the chat function will be disabled. Today's um, event is sponsored by the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. We began in 1988 as the North Carolina Center for Creative Retirement and joined the 121 member network of Osher Institutes in 2012. Our mission is to provide opportunities to thrive in life's second half through programs in lifelong learning, leadership, and research. Today's program is the third in a series of webinars that have been designed by Ollie at UNC Asheville's Inclusion Committee. The goal of the series is an effort to raise awareness and to inspire personal engagement and advocacy. Many thanks to Wallace Bohannon, Jane Callis, Bill Carpenter, Larry Haas, Sam Harbin, Annie Houle, Morgan Jackson, Sarah Reinke, and Dana Zarr, the members of Ollie's Inclusion Committee, for their thoughtful work to educate us about these issues in our community. I also want to thank Ollie Facilities and Communications Coordinator Jacqueline Lowe for her work organizing and running the webinars and organizing the publicity for this series. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Curry First. Curry was a civil rights lawyer in Milwaukee for 39 years. His practice included federal court civil rights litigation against police. He has resided in Asheville the last 11 years and is a past board member for the North Carolina American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, and the Prisoner Legal Service Board in Raleigh. As a member of the Racial Justice Coalition, he participated in the two-day workshop on developing a new use of force policy for the police department led by then Chief Tammy Hooper and the Vera Institute for Justice. Thank you very much. Curry. Uh, thank you, Catherine. I'm going to also like to welcome all of you to this educational program on racial justice in the criminal legal system. The issue of race and police the last months and today is gripping our nation and our community. It demands our attention, our listening, our learning, and moving forward to act and address meaningful reforms now. Our task today in this educational program has been described by the County Justice Resource Advisory Committee on June 3rd. In that report, this county agency called on all Buckham County residents to become familiar with the concepts of systematic and structural racism in the criminal justice system, system, how it impacts in a negative manner on communities of color. May we, may we learn some of this today. Now, how is the webinar gonna proceed? Uh, the Inclusive Committee and myself have decided to keep the format simple. We'll proceed in an open mic type fashion. After I introduce our three panelists, each will begin with 10 minutes to address the issues they choose within the topic. I will then ask the panel a few questions, and then following my questions of format will allow you, the class, an opportunity in the Q&A to participate with your own questions. Uh, if you have an interest in submitting questions, you'll notice on the Zoom panel uh, that there is a Q&A screen at the bottom. Click on that Q&A, open the box, type in your question, and then you can submit, and you can submit these questions at any time. Uh, now to introduce the distinguished panel. Uh, first, Ms. Leanne Melton. Uh, she's our first presenter and has a distinguished career in our state and community as a public defender, a career that goes back 24 years. She's currently the county's chief public defender uh, and she's been in that position for 12 years. Previously, she was in the same office 
as an assistant for 12 years. She administers an office here in the county with 24 public defenders, social workers, and investigators. In her role as a public defender, she has represented individuals charged with crimes ranging from misdemeanor to capital murder cases. She's received recognition statewide, including president of the North Carolina Public Defender Association, and three years ago received a, an award as co-recipient with Public Defender Race Equity Award. Our second presenter is our city manager, Ms. Deborah Campbell. She assumed this position in our community in December of 2018. She previously worked in Charlotte city government beginning in 1980, and in 2014 became assistant city manager in Charlotte. Ms. Campbell was born and raised in Chattanooga, obtained a bachelor of science degree in urban planning, a master's degree in public administration, both from Middle Tennessee State University. Her Asheville city manager job description is massive. Uh, she has important authority with the APD, the mayor, the council. Her position includes all department heads reporting to her. And while she's doing all those tasks, she has to administer a budget of $180 million. Our third panelist, Todd Williams, I'm sure you know, is the county chief prosecutor and our DA, having won an election in 2014 and reelected four years later. But his earlier legal background uh, was not on the prosecution or defense side, or was on the defense side. He had an active career as a public interest lawyer. He worked nearly 15 years as a capital defense defender including defendants charged with murder. He often worked with the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission. As DA, he has worked to reverse questionable convictions, including defendants exonerated and removed from North Carolina's death row. Uh, moving along, I'm now gonna turn the open mic for 10 minutes over to public defender, Ms. Milton. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Racism is a public health and public safety crisis. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the criminal justice system and the issues of race today. Um, we are in a time of crisis and we need to openly talk about issues of race and how we can go about seeking real reform in the criminal justice system. The Public Defender's Office is obviously <clears throat> part of the criminal justice system and needs to be held accountable for its efforts and its role that it plays in the criminal justice system. Just a little bit about the Public Defender's Office. <clears throat> we handle juvenile delinquency cases. We represent respondents in involuntary commitment hearings. We handle adult misdemeanor, adult and misdemeanor felony criminal cases. And we also handle capital murder cases as well. <clears throat> Our workload is admittedly too high. The National Center for State Courts recently did a workload study and said that we need additional 15 attorneys um, based on our workload. We only have 13 attorneys in the office currently. That includes me and a grant funded position from the county. Um, the entire court system is under resourced. We don't have enough judges. We don't have enough assistant district attorneys and we don't have enough assistant public defenders. When the courts are overburdened, um, it increases the risk that mistakes can happen. We all have unconscious biases, and when we don't have the time to be intentional and think about um, our decisions, those unconscious biases creep in and mistakes do happen. Um, the Public Defender's Office can and does have a huge role in the criminal justice system, and not every judicial district has a public defender's office. I think there are now 17 public defender's offices in the state of North Carolina. What I'd like to do is go over with you some of the ways that the Buncombe Public Defender Office has gone about seeking reform and addressing racial inequities in the system. I will be the first to admit that we still have a long way to go. 
And who becomes your next public defender is very important. I am actually retiring from the public defender's office on September 30th. Um, I have thoroughly um, um, found this position to be extremely rewarding, um, very difficult, but very rewarding. But the person who becomes your next public defender is very important. Um, their commitment to openly speaking about issues of race and their willingness to address disparities is very, appoint, very, very important. Um, I believe that candidate Carrie Glasso Grant for that position um, will openly speak about issues of race and will address those disparities if she's appointed as public defender. Um, some of the areas that the public defender's office um, can seek to address racial disparities and or seek reform includes zealously at um, bail hearings arguing for non-financial conditions of release. Due to um, structural racism um, and equity systemic in regards to um, wealth, intergenerational wealth, um, being released pre-trial when, when you're presumed innocent based on the amount of money that you can afford to pay um, impacts racial disparities in our um, pre-trial incarceration. So arguing for um, an ability to pay determination at bail hear hearings is very important. Um, addressing at sentencing issues of structural um, racism and bringing those issues to the attention of the court, um, also very important. Making sure with diversion courts that the assistant public defenders and public defender in the office offers that um, as an opportunity, explains the diversion opportunities to every single client, that is important. Community engagement listening to what the community has to say and encouraging the community to hold us as a public defender's office accountable. Being open to court watch programs so that we can learn what we are doing wrong in the court system. Um, again, going back to bail, advocating for access, um, advocating for ability to pay determinations for fines and costs and at um, bail hearings. Um, resisting fees for diversion programs. The Public Defender's Office um, in the past very strenuously argued um, that fees should not be charged for diversionary programs so everyone would have equal access to those programs. Advocating for written consent policies for searches. The Public Defender's Office did that in 2018 to City Council. Um, Seeking and advocating for um, restorative justice alternatives. Um, Mr. Williams in the district attorney's office, um, he and I have talked about those and I believe he is, is very open to um, restorative justice alternatives um, to, to be utilized. Um, it's, it's very important to have tough conversations and those conversations can lead to changes. Um, in 2016, Assistant Public Defender Yolanda Fair and I were members of the North Carolina Racial Equity Network at the UNC School of Government. It was funded by the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. And as part of that network, we received training on how to better raise issues of race in court. Um, after one of the trainings about bail, I inquired of the administrator of our jail at the time if we could start getting information about average bonds um, based on race and gender. Um, to make a very long story short, a dashboard was created that showed the average length of stay and average bond amounts by race and gender. In August of 2016, I was able to do a presentation to what was then known as the Justice Advisory Group, which has now become our Justice Resource Advisory Council, about the disparities that were being shown in that dashboard. Um, as a result of that presentation, a conversation was started about having a racial equity work group. And that racial equity work group was formed with a number of the criminal justice stakeholders here in Buncombe County. Having data, um, having that data informed us about what was going on and was extremely important to begin a robust dialogue. Um, out of the racial equity work group, which was chaired by Assistant Public Defender Yolanda Fair, an all-day implicit bias training was provided for court system stakeholders, which included assistant public defenders, a district attorney's office, judges, 
probation officers, some county commissioners, and the mayor attended that training as well. Um, so in 2018, the county was selected by the MacArthur Foundation to receive $1.75 million in grant funding as part of the Safety and Justice Challenge to address the drivers of local jail populations. The goal of the Safety and Justice Challenge is to reduce the overuse of our jail, address racial disparities, and increase community engagement. We actually currently have seven strategies, and I'm just going to briefly go over those 70 stra seven strategies of the Safety and Justice Challenge. Strategy number one is deflection at arrest and booking. Strategy number two is diversion to behavioral health and substance abuse treatment. Strategy three, enhance pretrial services. Strategy four, efficiencies in case processing. Strategy five, improve data utilization. Strategy six, increase community engagement. And strategy seven, address racial and ethnic disparities. Um, so in January of 2020, the Racial Equity Work Group put together some of the statistical findings that the county had pulled together and presented those statistics to the Justice Resource Advisory Council. Um, some of the statistics um, that I just want to present to you and go over with you um, indicate it, that in Buncombe County, in racial and ethnic demographics, um, white individuals make up in 2019 89.4% of the population and black or African American 6.3% of the population. But um, the Buncombe County Detention Facility race demographics in 2019, um, pretrial white individuals made up 73% of the population in incarcerated and black or African American 25.5%. Um, another disparity that um, came out of those statistics also indicated on felony releases that um, black individuals on average stayed um, 46.9 days in custody, but white individuals stayed on average 32.9 days um, in custody. The statistics show that Blacks have a 4% decreased chance of being released on pretrial supervision because they are more likely to also be held with a secured bond, while Whites have a 4% increased chance of being released on pretrial supervision without a monetary bond. Um, for higher level felonies, Blacks remain in custody on average 14 days longer than Whites. And I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I think we need to look at our system and figure out what role does the public defender's office play in that? Are we, are we advocating appropriately to the court system? Um, and what can we do to address those disparities? And we need to have a, an open dialogue um, and be very introspective and look at what's going on in our criminal justice system. Um, and with, when the pandemic started, there was a, 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 an effort, a very collaborative effort um, to reduce our jail population and only, um, and, and release nonviolent crimes on non-financial conditions of release when, and when those individuals could be safely done so. And we dramatically, um, through collaboration, reduce our jail population. And I believe um, and that reduction was approximately 42%. Um, but unfortunately, the disparities based on race actually increased during that time period. And I believe um, it went from the most recent data, um, it, the racial disparity has gone to um, just under 30%. Um, um, we need to, to intentionally look at those issues and, 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 and at every point in the process and figure out um, what we can do to address those issues. Um, and I think in terms of real reform, some of the areas that we can have the biggest impact is on bail. Um, our, um, our money bail system, um, we have a... Um, some real opportunities um, to address these issues with our bail policies. I know that there are discussions going on about, um, you know, requiring potentially in our bail policy written findings 
when a, uh, when a magistrate or a judge imposes a secured bond as to why they're imposing that secured bond to, in, in, to make sure that intentionality is occurring. Um, and also to require an ability to pay determination. Whether or not you're released from custody pretrial should not be based on your wealth. It should be based on your risk of, um, of to, to the community in terms of, of safety and, and, the, and, the, and the evidence that there is currently the strength of the evidence that's, that's against you. Alamance County recently revised their bail policy as a result of a lawsuit by the um, ACLU, um, which now requires written findings of fact and those ability to pay determinations. Um, Spending just one day in custody can have a huge impact on your life and on the outcome of your case. You can lose your job. You can lose um, your housing. Um, it's, it's, that's something that, that really needs to be addressed currently. Um, we need the court system and the public defender's office needs to listen to the community and, and learn what issues are most important to the community. Um, we currently have a community engagement work group as part of the MacArthur Foundation, and I think the information that we're getting from that work group um, is invaluable. Um, I would encourage court watchers and have those court watchers um, give the Public Defender's Office and the community engagement work group information about ways the court system um, can improve. Um, and I'm looking forward to answering any questions that anybody has later. Thank you. Curry, you are muted. Oh, I always do that. I'm un unmuted. Our, thank you, Ms. Milton. Our second panelist will be speaking for 10 minutes. And I want to briefly describe her authority and relationship with the police chief and the police department. Uh, the police chief is subject to the control of the city manager. Uh, the, the city manager supervises uh, the chief and may recommend policy. That's in City Ordinance Chapter 13. Um, uh, Ms. Campbell, do you want to go ahead for approximately 10 minutes open mic, please? Absolutely. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel with this esteemed uh, guest. Uh, I need the uh, PowerPoint presentation to come up now, please. And I have a number of slides, but I promise you I can step through them relatively quickly. And while that's low, again, is Deborah Carroll as city manager. Next slide, please. It's fine. The only reason that I just slide up and I'll, um, moderator already gave kind of background, but I just bring your attention to uh, the majority of my career has been spent in the urban plane. I say that because um, I've worked with a lot of low and moderate income communities and one of the major issues um, related to these communities is uh, community safety. It was an issue of being overly under -released. I have uh, a little bit of your understanding of the huge dynamics of how community safety is to a solar community. Next slide, please. I'm not seeing the, the transition on my end. Deborah, I think we're having a little bit of a connection issue. Um, so um, let's, I'll, I'll try to talk through um, without having, having the slide. Is that, is that okay? Um, it is up. I think we're having a slight internet connection issue here. So do you want to make it while we 
try to get through this or how would you like to handle it? Um, let's go ahead and uh, mute your video while you're going through your presentation and let's see if that helps a little bit. Uh, just your video. And we can bring your sound back up and let's give that a try. Okay, sounds back up and you ready? All set. Okay. All right, are you seeing so the, the slide? City, yes, I am. The city of Asheville works under a council manager form of government. And I only have, again, this slide up because I want to make sure that there um, is a distinction between the role of what our elected officials does and what the city manager does. Next slide, please. For the most part, um, city council is really more responsible for policy, for developing visions and priorities for the community, not administering and managing staff. Next slide. The administration and management of staff is the responsibility of the city manager which is the role that, that, that I am in. And I think you heard a little bit in terms of the relationship between the police department and the department head, heads as it relates to um, the city manager. Next slide. Our organizational structure, we have generally about 17 departments, one of which, of course, is the police. Police and fire are kind of our community safety types of services and departments that the city of Asheville um, is responsible for. Um, the police department, as it relates to this subject matter, unfortunately is um, kind of the pipeline for um, people coming into the, the criminal justice system. So a lot of responsibility and uh, of, as it relates to impacts of, of people's lives really rests within that first point of entry, that first uh, interaction um, with the with the police. Next slide, please. The poli uh, police's role and responsibilities is really to provide public safety and maintain order and enforce and uphold uh, the laws of the, the Constitution, U.S. state, and, and city ordinances. Um, next slide, please. Most don't really realize the broad scope of duties and, and, and services that the police department administers. Uh, the majority though of our resources are in that um, patrol districts. And that patrol district really is out to literally prevent crime. Um, sometimes when you see a police car, you do not want to, um, to um, have an encounter um, that you know may, uh, uh, impact your life that may put you into the prison pipeline. Uh, the other issue with patrol is sometimes, as I said earlier, in terms of being under police, uh, we never see a police car in, in the community, which uh, creates a level uh, that um, people feel unsafe. Next slide, please. We just recently hired uh, our chief of police uh, out of New York. Uh, he has 30 years of police experience, and in particular, he has experience um, related to uh, social and economic justice types of issues, and uh, has a, a extensive experience in community policing, and that was really a reason why we wanted to bring uh, Chief Zach to, to Asheville. Um, over the past um, year and eight months that I've been here, uh, we have had uh, five chiefs of police, which includes some of those uh, officers that uh, served in an interim role. Next slide, please. So obviously, you know, with the national um, dialogue and um, the things that have happened locally with all the demonstrations as it relates to social justice and the uh, abhorrent, um, I was getting ready to say murder of George uh, Floyd um, and many other uh, African-American, mostly men. Um, 
there's been a laser focus on the issues of disparate um, policing in our community. And I put this quote up, to meet these challenges, law enforcement should consider not only new tools, but also new policing strategies. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about in terms of, of things that have changed for the Asheville Police Department. And I know that we want to think of these things as you know, this is happening um, in the um, national arena. And so it must be happening also uh, in the local arena. And sometimes that's just not the case. Next slide, please. And so we realize that because there is such um, a, a laser focus on policing and there are some things happening nationally, that at a local level, there's a tremendous amount of distrust for the Asheville Police Department. And I will be the first to say that to a certain extent, we've earned that reputation, but to a larger extent, we have tried to develop lots of policies to, um, and, and, and strategies uh, to overcome that. Community concerns about systemic racism um, nationwide. It includes, again, APD's past incidents. And um, we're, we're willing and ready, and we think we're able to begin to address these issues in a serious manner. Next slide, please. And so one of the uh, national initiatives is, is around Eight Can't Wait campaign. And the reason that I said earlier about things that are happening at the federal and the national level, um, we are so proud that APD has actually all eight of these uh, initiatives in place. And so we think that we are ahead of the game. We hope that these are not just policies on paper. We hope that we are executing these in a manner that will minimize the impact, particularly on black and brown people. Uh, and so obviously it's the execution of these. We definitely know that we have the policies that have been, been adopted. And I guess we just got to work harder on executing them in a fair and equitable way. Next slide, please. So um, we've changed our use of, of force. Uh, you, I think you heard um, Leanne talk about us, and, and maybe that wasn't the one she was talking about, but there has been a group that was organized in order for us to uh, make uh, significant changes uh, in our use of force uh, policies. Next slide, please. We ban chokeholds, uh, we don't condone them, and uh, they're prohibited uh, as part of our deadly use of force policy. Next slide, please. We require de-escalation. We hear a lot about uh, why did you have to shoot them? Why couldn't we de-escalate? Uh, and we do have uh, a de-escalation policy uh, and it is a part of our use of force policy. Next slide, please. We have de-escalation training and um, we have a crisis intervention um, program and 85% of all of our APD officers are certified in crisis intervention training. Next slide, please. We require warning uh, before shooting. Uh, again, that's a part of our use of force policy. Next slide, please. We require that our officers uh, use the amount of force that is objectively reasonable. Uh, and again, a part of our use of force policy. Next slide, please. A duty to intervene. And I think this is one that really relates to um, the unfortunate um, incident with uh, George Floyd, where um, if maybe one of the officers had intervened, um, the results may not have been as they were. Uh, ethical policing is courageous. Um, all of our officers have completed, all of our officers, officers have completed this training uh, where the duty to intervene uh, is, is emphasized. Um, and if something happens, uh, it must be promptly reported to, to a supervisor. Next slide, please. 
We banned shooting at moving vehicles. Um, next slide. We require use of force continuum, which means that we only should be applying whatever force uh, is, is necessary. Next slide, please. We require comprehensive uh, reporting. Um, all use of force incidents are reviewed by officers chain of command and professional standards section. So we are getting into a pipeline. Next slide, please that fewer than 45% of other agencies within uh, our um, uh, within our region um, report this information to, to the FBI. Next slide, please. This is the one that Leanne was talking about, which is the written consent to search. And it actually, that uh, date is wrong. It should be, uh, actually 2018 and finally adopted in 2020 in terms of implementation, the written consent to search policy. On um, this one, there was tremendous data related to um, a disparate number of African-Americans being um, uh, stopped, particularly for, for um, traffic violations. Um, this current policy only pertains to vehicles though and not, not individuals. Next slide, please. And so we've come to a pivotal point um, in um, our issues related to public safety. And um, we think that we have put a tremendous amount of responsibility on um, police persons and um, policing and not looking at it holistically. So we're undertaking a, a, a process to reimagine policing in Asheville. We want to take those 17 departments that we talked about, because um, it would be 16 excluding um, police, and try to understand, are there things from a broader holistic perspective that we can do to assist the police in making people feel safe in their community? So our goal, uh, over the next several months, uh, probably I say months, but it'll probably be years to determine how the city of Asheville structures its department responsibilities and community partnerships in a way that promotes racial equity and economic inclusion. Next slide, please. But this has been focused more or less around policing. We, we, we hear concerns that the current model just isn't working, particularly for Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. Um, I've talked about over-policing, it seems to criminalize and victimize, victimize Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. So our goal is to make folks feel safer in their communities without additional law enforcement, uh, but to look at uh, other things like health and economic uh, job opportunities, educational human services, and other things to stabilize people in their communities. Next slide, please. So our next steps. Um, is to start this uh, dialogue. And um, we'll be working with as many folks as we can uh, in the community to, to assist us in reimagining public safety. Next slide. Um, we are at, uh, the, in this process, we are in um, this the second part of the process to host the community meetings. Next slide. And these, uh, we've selected some facilitators that are going to help us um, have that conversation with the community. Uh, Shamika Ebony is the group, and then Christine Edwards with uh, Amplify Charlotte are the um, key um, consultants that we'll be working with. Next slide, please. And um, we are going to focus our efforts on people of color. Uh, the people who are most impacted by policing or has the potential to be impacted by um, police officers. Uh, we're going to have surveys and questionnaires and blogs and just a, a broad community conversation around this issue. Next slide, please. Next slide, please.
Um, Ms. Campbell, we're, uh, I'm watching the clock here, if you could. Um, I'm sorry, the slots aren't advancing. We are on slide uh, public engagement processes. Is that appearing on your screen? So let me just conclude that uh, over the next couple of weeks, we will be conducting this public engagement and dialogue. Yes. Okay. Can you go to the next slide, please? So moving forward, um, and I'm not sure what happened because either I was frozen or the slides were frozen, uh, but um, to summarize, we've heard the community, we want to respond and move forward over the next 90 uh, couple of, of weeks we will be having these community conversations and we will be collaborating with lots of other groups and um, organizations within the community and i thank you and apologize for all the technical difficulties thanks uh thank you uh todd williams do you want to go ahead please with your open mic 10 minutes Sure, thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Todd Williams. I'm the district attorney here for uh, all of Buncombe County. And uh, I do appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to talk. Um, Curry, I also appreciate uh, your, your introduction, uh, uh, you know, all the honorables and all the rest of it. But you may be just a slightly, slightly too, too honorable, I, I'd contend. I want to clear some of that up. Uh, I was uh, a capital defender for about two years before I, I opted to run for this office. Um, I was a public defender for about 11. Um, so about 13, almost 14 years, I was, I was basically doing indigent defense work. I was licensed here in North Carolina in the year 2000. Um, in law school, I like to throw out that uh, my very first internship, I, I, I frankly went to law school because I was very interested in, um, in well, criminal justice. And I had some other interest in law too. Uh, but my first internship was a death penalty prisoners prisoner rights internship uh, at the Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta. And, um, you know, because a lot of people know the name uh, Brian Stevenson and, uh, and his book, Just Mercy, uh, this is where he began his career. So in the mid nineties, um, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was somewhat attuned to many of the systemic issues um, you know, involving death penalty, criminal justice, uh, and it was a motivating factor in, in my decision to go to law school and then follow through uh, after graduation to be a public defender and, and, and end up, what I thought was going to be my terminal position was a, was a capital defender's position. Um, and then, you know, sometimes uh, our best laid plans uh, lead us on a different path. And here I am as a district attorney. Um, so uh, as the district attorney, uh, you know, we talked earlier today, Curry, I thought it was important to, uh, to mention to folks what it is that, that, that the DA does. Um, we represent the state of North Carolina in criminal prosecutions and in juvenile court and sometimes nuisance, uh, nuisance abatement civil actions. That's extremely infrequently. Um, district, there are 44 district attorneys across the state of North Carolina. Uh, in some districts, there are multiple counties. Um, west of here, there's, uh, there's another district. It goes from Jackson all the way over to the Tennessee line. Um, our, our district, however, is Buncombe County and all the uh, municipalities within it. Um, we have, in the court system, we have um, nine judges or so. I might be off one. Um, we have multiple number of magistrates. We have the public defender's office. We have the criminal defense bar. Uh, we, have, we have multiple different law enforcement agencies, APD, Black Mountain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the district attorney's office does occupy um, uh, a linchpin role in the criminal justice system in that everything that's handled criminally after it's charged comes through as handled by uh, the district attorney's office. And my office is made up of uh, me plus 17 assistants. We have 18 attorneys in the office uh, and support staff. We're, we're 
probably right around 40 when you when you calculate everybody. Um, uh, two two investigators that are that are on staff for trial support, and um, and uh, victim witness legal assistance. Um, our role in the DA's office starts once charges are filed, and in North Carolina, as opposed to some other states, uh, North Carolina is a direct file state, meaning that when a crime occurs. Uh, law enforcement goes to a magistrate. Uh, I mean, the magistrate's office is a judicial office that's separate and apart from the DA's office and takes out a criminal warrant or initiates a criminal process, summons, whatever it might be. Uh, citizens can also initiate the, the, the criminal process. Uh, the DA's office takes no role in the investigation of crime. And uh, and we don't charge. We have no. We have virtually no capacity to charge crime. So our our role fundamentally comes in once go for us is you know a paper uh, is filed in the court system. That is go for us. And at that juncture, um, we're employed as as your as your prosecutors as your prosecutorial agency, and we have what's called uh, discretion. Uh, to an important, in appropriate cases, uh, you know, take it all the way through the bitter end of jury trial, you know, uh, uh, for, you know, the, the maximum amount of statutory punishment in a certain case, or uh, we can reduce charges um, in the interest of justice or because of, of, a, of a disparity in evidence, uh, or uh, just simply because, uh, you know, an individual's, uh, an individual, the, the, perhaps mercy is the word, uh, or, you know, a second chance or whatever is, is warranted. Our job as prosecutors is to do justice in each case. Um, it's actually a rule of ethics for, for DAs. We are not here as prosecutors to merely convict, but we're to do justice case by case. Um, and so we see that, I mean, most, I think most people that interact with the DA's office come, come to the courthouse on traffic matters. And, you know, I think it's very clear to the public that, you know, the public expects that, you know, if you're charged with, you know, radar said you're 17 miles over the speed, the speed limit, people know to come and ask the district attorney's office for, uh, you know, uh, some sort of relief on that. Uh, so it doesn't impact uh, collaterally interests like uh, uh, insurance or, or license revocation and those other things. And that's really our, that's, a bro that's sort of a broad, you know, uh, I guess, analogy to, to the way we look at many cases that are before the DA's office that, 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 that we are prosecuting. Um, that being said, uh, when I came in in 2015, there was there was really no diversion um, option in the criminal in the criminal justice system that, that didn't require uh, some sort of statement of omission, uh, either on paper or before the court. It didn't require some sort of uh, uh, you know public uh, pronouncement, even even potentially a judgment uh, in front of the court, and. Uh, I advocated very strenuously for diversion for cases that are post-charge, meaning that say we have someone who's, uh, um, who's a first time offender, uh, who has uh, a substance abuse problem, uh, you know, whatnot. Uh, if we had a way to ask folks to comply with a certain regimen, uh, do some service perhaps, take a class perhaps, do some, some group uh, uh, sessions or, or whatever is appropriate, uh, we would take a dismissal in the interest of justice. Um, thankfully now we have, we have a pretty round and healthy uh, menu of, of various diversion op options. We have adult misdemeanor diversion for first offenders. We have uh, felony drug diversion. And we have, uh, we have a pre-charge juvenile diversion in addition to some other programs. Um, I uh, uh, have been advocating um, for a long while for uh, a build out of additional uh, resources 
uh, that are kind of beyond the scope of the DA's office. Because again, our role starts when a charge is filed. But as I believe Ms. Melton um, stated, once that charge is filed, sometimes that leads to custody. Sometimes that leads to collateral consequences just because the charge is in the system. Um, if we were able to develop uh, resources for law enforcement to divert folks who are um, suffering from substance abuse, mental health, the, 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 the typical kinds of situations that I think the public is, is quite, uh, uh, quite aware of, if we, could, if we could coordinate services so that these folks aren't ever brought into the criminal justice system as appropriate, um, I think we'd have sustainable, we, we potentially would have a sustainable new, a new, a new structure for criminal justice uh, here in Buncombe County. I've been advocating for that and some of the, some of the items that, uh, that we've just recently been discussing are a co-responder model to bring uh, EMS uh, into the into the into the system, so they're co corresponding with uh, with the police, um, and uh, to create a physical facility that would be co-located for services for for folks who have mental health and some substance abuse disorders, very similar to the Family Justice Center uh, model that we have for victims. Um, so we've achieved. Uh, some significant new um, new pieces of reform, but there's more that's that that's on the plate that's ahead of us. That's going to that that frankly requires collaboration. It requires county uh, uh, government folks. It requires city folks. Uh, it requires department heads of, of of law enforcement agencies to move the system. Um, I just took some notes while uh, some of our panelists were talking, so. Uh, uh, I want to I want to mention bail. Uh, Miss Melton uh, said that. Uh, 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 well, Miss Melton said what she said, but but bail is something that you know obviously it's it's bail reform, cash bail. Uh, th these are things that uh, that the public is really clamoring for relief on and really want to see some movement on. Uh, what we're looking at here in the court system is fundamentally i don't have uh, i don't have a fancy exhibit like uh, or a powerpoint like miss campbell but i mean we look at we look at our statutes right this is the law um in regard to bail we need we need raleigh to to really make a fundamental change in terms of are we, are we going to get rid of cash bail? We can't do it entirely here locally. However, that being said, uh, I think Ms. Melton would admit uh, that she and I drafted uh, a proposed policy and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been presented to judges for their consideration. It's ultimately going to be up to judges uh, to, uh, uh, to implement or adopt uh, a, a bond policy. But uh, part of the part of the, the, the emphasis that we we have uh, suggested is that as much as possible, the, the bail bond policy needs to be as fair. It needs to be uh, imposing financial conditions only in the only in the uh, only in cases uh, uh, of public safety uh, or in victim victims rights uh, uh, type cases. Uh, and as much as possible, folks who don't need to be in custody, uh, the DA's office doesn't doesn't. Uh, you know, doesn't have a position. We don't, we don't necessarily want folks who, who aren't public safety risks to be in custody. And in court, we have uh, made it a practice to consent uh, to the release of folks uh, who are in custody for non-Victims Rights Act uh, and non-violent uh, type cases. Uh, let me just intervene. Uh, we've got about four or five minutes left and we want to get to some questions in the queue and I know you have to leave at four. Um, but why don't you conclude and then we'll uh, wait. Where well, you and, and you raised this morning and perhaps you wanted to jump on this, Curry, but you wanted to ask about uh, police accountability. And, and I'll hit that really quickly. Please. Uh, uh, th this, is, this is a huge, this is, this is a huge issue. Uh, and uh, it, I mean, it's very complicated. It's fraught with, with all kinds of issues. When, when police misconduct occurs, you need, best practice would be to get an outside agency to investigate that police conduct. It would also be 
preferable to have uh, an, an independent prosecutor outside of the district to come in and prosecute the case. And states have adopted that kind of reform. Um, Iowa, um, there, there's been a couple, I think Colorado is a third, there might have been a fourth. Since the George Floyd murder, uh, a number of states have come forward. Iowa is, is a very, um, I guess, Republican-leaning state in their legislature. They were able to bipartisanly uh, enact police reform, police accountability package that puts prosecution of, of police misconduct in the hands of the statewide attorney general rather than local district attorneys. Um, I've talked to all our legislators, legislators here uh, locally about this, and uh, it's a non-starter in North Carolina. The, the, the Raleigh legislature will not take this up. They say maybe next year. Uh, but uh, that being said, locally, again, uh, similar to Bond, we've done an incremental step here locally. Uh, we recently have enacted a, a, a memorandum of understanding, which is bilateral between my office and, and all of our uh, municipal to police departments, uh, that they are obligated to report police misconduct. And it's founded on, um, I don't want to get too in the weeds, but it's founded on criminal procedure pr principles of disclosure in criminal cases to defendants. Um, uh, and uh, I'm very proud of the fact that I want to say in 2015, I initially started this discussion and it was very hard to talk to law enforcement about, uh, about a memorandum of understanding, a bilateral uh, mutual understanding about how to report misconduct without it kind of getting um, contentious. Uh, the fact that we were able to get every municipal law enforcement agency in the county at the table to sign off on this, and they all understand that now is the moment to move forward and to show, um, you know, show the recognition of the need uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to address this and, uh, and, and prioritize accountability above everything else. Got to have justice and accountability before public relations, politics, and liability or civil liability concerns. And, and I think that our local law enforcement have, uh, have, have stepped up and they want to move the dialogue forward. So uh, that being said, Curry, I'll Thank you. land on that. Yeah, I, I see, you know, we're running out of time. I see two purposes today. The one we've done, which is to educate people. We're 113 participants about these issues. But the second thing is to motivate and engage them to be involved in our community, dealing with racial disparities in the criminal legal system. Um, uh, Ms. Campbell's 30, 60, 90 day program does have an ask to the community to get involved. And Ms. Milton talked about uh, community involvement and she talked about the uh, work group with the County Advisory Council. Uh, she talked about court watchers. So Ms. Milton, could you talk a little bit about um, how you think our community, people with us today, we could participate in an appropriate way and uh, help us move forward? Well, I think in, um, in Orange County, North Carolina, there's a court watcher program, and I think in other jurisdictions in North Carolina, I think it's always good to have feedback on terms of how we're doing. Um, I've been in the system for, in the, in the criminal justice system for 24 years. I've seen the same thing over and over again. It would be nice to, to get more perspective from individuals who can see it for the first time or, or, or see what, because I have been doing it for so long, what I can't see anymore. Um, and I think that that helps facilitate change. Um, I know that um, that information would be invaluable to the public defender's office. What can we do better? How are we interacting with the court system? What can we argue differently to the court? Um, we have a Justice Resource Advisory Council. Those meetings are open to the public. We talk about issues in the criminal justice system where our priority should be to improve the criminal justice system. We talk about the racial disparity data. Those meetings are usually held um, on the last, excuse me, the first Friday of each month. Um, it may be every other month now, but they're actually being done virtually now. Um, if you go to the Buncombe County webpage for the Buncombe County Justice Resource Advisory Council, um, the court minutes, not the court minutes, but the minutes from those meetings are, are contained there. 
Um, I think recently two individuals were selected from the community to be part of the Justice Resource Advisory Council. Um, one of those individuals I believe is Jay Hackett. I am drawing a blank on the name of the other individual and I apologize for that. But community is actually gonna be involved as part of that. The Justice Resource Advisory Council needs to hear from the community and, and the Justice Resource Advisory Council needs to listen to what the community has to say so that we can actually effectuate change. And we need to be informed of what that change should be and um, have the community help us figure that out. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Campbell, what's your view on how uh, your office and the city can engage the community in an appropriate way to support, learn about, and uh, help us address this issue of racial disparity? Well, <clears throat> we think first and foremost, our uh, initial effort at this will be reimagining safety. Uh, by five o'clock, uh, if you go to the city of Asheville's website, you will find um, a number of opportunities uh, to become engaged, uh, to talk about the concept of public safety in our, in our community. I think that's our, our, the first we want, we want to start. We also, um, as well as the county, uh, the city uh, council adopted a um, reparations resolution and I'm sure that it will be dealing with, obviously, uh, not only disparity as a criminal justice system, but disparity as it relates to other social and economic issues. Um, we will be forming a commission. Uh, that commission should happen uh, probably around November or December in terms of its formation. So those are two um, opportunities to get engaged and involved. Thank you. Uh, we're about out of time. Um, I'm going to give folks, if and they may want it, they may not, my email, which is easy, lowercase c first, f i r s t, at macmac.com. So if there's things that you'd like more information on that came out of this uh, hour today, um, I will do my best to get back to you so that we can keep this moving forward so that people wanting to learn, wanting to continue to learn, and want to be leaders in the community on this issue. There is no bigger issue in this community at this time and place uh, than race in the criminal legal system. And uh, we, need to, we need to focus on that and remember that. Uh, I want to thank the panel um, for your service to the city and the county. I want to thank the panel for participating today. And I want to turn it back to the boss, Ms. Frank. Um, thanks so much, Curry, and thank you uh, to all of our panelists. Um, we will work with Curry uh, to get some resources on our website, and we have a weekly email newsletter, and we'll link them in there as well, because as Curry emphasizes, we want this not just to be education, but to move to advocacy and engagement. So thank you for all, to all of you for inspiring us to think along those lines. Uh, we'll ho we hope you'll join us on Wednesday, September 16th at 4 p.m. for our webinar on disparity in education featuring Jesse Pitts, who is a counselor at Asheville Middle School, Sainina Tovar, an ESL teacher for Buncombe County Schools, and Buffy Fowler, who is the operations coordinator at Francine Delaney New School. Again, thank you so much to all of our, um, to Larry Haas and Bill Carpenter, who put this panel together, to all the members of Ollie's Inclusion Committee, and to all of you who have come today to learn more about this important issue in our community. Thank you.